Wherever there are shadows, there are people ready to kick at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. This is Bleeding Daylight with your host, Rodney Olson. Welcome. Please share Bleeding Daylight episodes through your social media accounts or through word of mouth so that more people can kick against the darkness. You'll find more episodes and our social media links at bleedingdaylight.net. In many areas of life, things aren't always what they seem to be. And that's what today's guest found out almost too late. I'll introduce you in just a moment. My guest today has worked extensively throughout Australia and Southeast Asia, helping people claim back time. He says that he can help us all gain back an hour a day, Thanks to his expertise in time management, Les Watson has earned the nickname Time Lord. We might touch on some of those skills later, but we're chatting to him today to explore a very different side of his life. Les, thank you so much for joining me on Bleeding Daylight. Great to be here, Rodney. Thanks very much. Let's go back some years to the time that a friend invited you to something that was promoted as a personal development seminar. What did life look like for you back at that time and and what was that seminar all about? I was a lad. <laughs> I was such a lad. Oh, I cannot believe I kind of go, oh, really? I was in the fitness industry. We were having a great time and he came back to work one day and gave me a hug and I've gone, he never hugs me. I don't understand. And he said, oh, you've got to come and do this seminar. And I've gone, okay, because I trusted the, the group that I was with, the group of friends that I was with to the point where they say we're moving state, we move state, which I did. I, I ended up moving from Tasmania onto the mainland and, and got involved with health and fitness. He said, come and do this seminar. And this personal development seminar was called Insight Seminars. It changed my life. It really did change my life. I got a greater awareness of who I was, where I was in the world and what worked for me and what didn't work for me. Little did I know that it was a front for a cult. You don't know these things. You you kind of go along. And I I did the first seminar, and I thought that was great. I did a time management seminar after that in the organization. I thought that was great. And I did the second one in Australia. I thought that was great. Third one, fabulous. They said come over to America and do one, and I sold everything I had and went over and did that and learned how to facilitate groups. That was me being in a cult. The front was education, and the back was a spiritual cult called the movement of spiritual inner awareness. I didn't realize it was a cult. It took me finding the love of my life and her actually saying, I'm not getting out of anything out of these meetings. In fact, I'm bored. I want to leave. And I go, no, 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 no. You don't leave. No one leaves. What do you mean leave? <laughs> uh, and we, we uh, toed and froed and toed and froed over certain weeks and months. It came a point where we were reading a book called A Course in Miracles, Marianne Williamson. The word Christ was in the book, and the scales fell from my wife's eyes and went, what am I doing? I know the answer is Christ. What am I doing? Of course, she was actually born again. She was a Christian and came into the New Age, fortunately got me in this this awakening for her. She said. I want to go back, I want to, I want to talk to a Christian and I want to give my life back to Christ. Who do you know? And I said, I know my friend Alan, but I don't want to go to him because he'll preach at me. And she said, no, no, we've got to go. Would you like to come with me? I said, oh, all right, I'll go. And we went down there and within 10 minutes she gave a, a heart back to Christ and, and then the clouds parted and a big booming voice said, what about you, Les? And no, that didn't happen. But we had this backwards and forwards conversation about Christianity and doing it, not doing it, doing it, not doing it. And half an hour later, I went, look, why don't we just do this prayer and see what happens? Because I could do this forever. I said the salvation prayer and some things dropped off my life immediately, like absolutely immediately. Pornography went out the window and never returned. For some people, the hooks of pornography stay in for a long, 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 long time and hard to get out. Christ came in and porn went. And I went, if that's not a miracle, I do not know what is. 
So that was the Saturday. On the Sunday, I found myself on the altar at a church in Sydney called Christian City Church or C3, and I was on the altar, and my wife took my son out, and when she turned around and looked at the monitors, she found that I was on the altar giving my heart to Christ and in a public setting, not a, a lounge room, and the rest is history. I was 13 years in the New Age, and it was 1998 that I gave my life to Christ, and the rest has been a journey with Jesus. It's an amazing story, and that gives us the big picture. So let's delve into some of those details, because it's interesting. It starts out as this personal development course, then you realize that it's a cult. And firstly, I suppose we need to recognize that in many cults, in many alternative beliefs, there is truth in there. There is some truth, and that's what hooks us in the first place. This is actually making a difference in my life. This is something that's helpful for me. And that's the hook before it starts to veer off, isn't it? Oh, very much so. It was the truth veiled, so to speak. It was so close to the truth that it looked bright and shiny and welcoming, but it was off. Yes, there were truths in there. They are masqueraded in a, a form of it's all about self and therefore if you're looking after yourself, then your truth is your truth and no one should argue with that. There were people that, in the back end, I, I learned to realise or came to realise that people as Christians came in and could see how it was so close and yet so far, but I didn't know any different. I was unchurched. I sang in the, the church choir as a child. That was my understanding of church. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I didn't ha- didn't know anything about the Bible. My background, my mum and dad were publicans, so they had a, a pub and it wasn't a part of my life. I knew right from wrong, but I didn't know how to do the right thing all the time. Like I didn't have a, a moral compass that was solid, that was rooted in God in that regard. So therefore, in the new age, it was... Your truth is your truth, and you make it up as you go along. You're learning things about personal development, about yourself, and probably some helpful things along the way, Mm -hmm. but it was taking you in a different direction. When did the spiritual element start to be added, or were there shades of that all the way through that you didn't recognize until it started to loom a whole lot larger? My friends, the ones that got me involved with Insight and MSAA, they went on a journey a personal development journey themselves before getting into, as we were in the health and fitness industry, there was a a particular guy that came along and he said that everyone's made up of the physical, the mental and the spiritual. Now I was in gym, so I had the physical down pat. I was educated to a certain degree. I could hold an argument and do a crossword. So I, I had the mental down pat, but I had no idea of the spiritual whatsoever. They decided they were going to go to Hare Krishnas and different churches and check out what spiritual meant. And I'd never even come across that in my life. It wasn't something that people were alongside me with a a spiritual background. So when they did that and then ended up in a personal development with a cult in the background, they said, oh, now that you've done the personal development, why don't you come to a meeting and learn from the founder of the organization that started Insight. He's got other meetings, and you might like to come to those. The first meeting that I went to, I fell asleep. For whatever reason, I just went to sleep, and I think I did the second one as well. Someone was trying to save me at that point, but it didn't work, and I got into that, and I was there for 13 years, like 13 years. To come out of that, kind of put that one on a hook, so... We'll talk about coming out of it in a minute, but it was a uh, quite a journey to come out of a cult internally, not externally. Externally, it was walking out the door, but internally, it was quite a journey. And the interesting thing is that these were friends that had introduced you to this whole idea. And sometimes we can make up this picture in our mind that cults are filled with people that are sort of rubbing their hands together thinking, who's the next one we can hook in and, and grab in? And they've all got this, this evil intent. But by the sounds of it, these are friends of yours who thought that they had found something and they were actually trying to help you with what they had found. Indeed. Because it was based in a personal development, did you get 
good understanding to get a, a change of life from doing that personal development, then the spiritual side will add to that. I knew that if the personal development side changed my life, I wanted to tell more people about that. And if I was in the spiritual, then I would tell people about that as well. So I was one of the front people for the personal development and was espousing that at the drop of a hat. Like I would be in a, getting a sandwich and I'd talk to people how good it was and enroll them from there. So as far as if you would call a Christian evangelist, I was a new age evangelist. I had an, um, a reputation in the organization in the world as one of the best in the business. So I was invited to America to do that sort of work. And I actually said, yep, thank you, but I'll stay in Australia. And I'm so glad I did because it, it led me to where I am today rather than getting caught up in the trappings of being in America and, and doing those things. Now, this might be a bit of a tangent, but I, I'm seeing here that, as you say, you're an evangelist for this movement because you have found something that at this point you think this is the answer and you're so keen to share it with everyone, whether they're selling you a sandwich or friends or whoever it might be. Why do you think it is that those of us who follow Jesus and understand that he is the answer to life are sometimes so reticent to share that good news with other people? Because it's a simple fact of the enemy wants us to keep us in the dark, number one, and there'll be scales in our eyes and our ears will be, be blocked and our heart will be hard to the gospel so that the enemy plays that part of, no, I'm keeping them trapped, I'm keeping them trapped, I'm keeping them trapped. And when you said me being an evangelist, I thought in coming to Christ, it would be as simple as switching the switch from professing how good the new age was to professing how good Christ was. And I'm going, come on, Lord, let me go down the street. Come on, let me pull them all in and do home church and, and do that. And he went, no. I went, what do you mean, no? I, I, I'm, I'm itching. It's like that's what I did in the new age. I was... I was the Paul in the new age. It's like, why would, why would you not? It's like, nah, I need to get that out of you. <laughs> so I was on the back burner for years and years and years and years and years so that I was able to get a firm foundation in Christ before I started to talk to people about the gospel. So it was solid and rooted in Christ as opposed to the remnants of my understandings and teaching to the new age. I'm interested in the book that you mentioned, A Course in Miracles, because I've seen it mentioned here and there, and it's always been something troubling to me because I know that it's certainly not scripture. And yet sometimes even I see people that are on the fringes of Christianity are reading this book and taking this as part of something that will awaken them to the reality of life. Tell me what's actually in this book. What's it about? That is a great question because it was many years ago, so we're talking 1998, just prior to that. Have I, have I burnt it? Probably. Have I given it away? Probably. I let it go. But the, the piece in the background was it mentions Christ. It mentions the word Christ or Christ consciousness or along those lines. Marianne Williamson was a Christian and she moved away and got lured into the, the new age in that regard and went off from the truth. We say that there is only one truth, and that's the Bible, and it's from the beginning of the Bible, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Why? Because it's the Word of God. Yet some people take that and go, yeah, but, yeah, but what about this and what about that? And I go, I'll just stick with the Bible. I'll just stick with the Bible. Does that make me a zealot? No, I, I can have great conversations with people and I don't hit them over the head with it, I find out where people are and love them through to an understanding. And I, most recently, Rodney, I've had somebody do that. I've been working with them and mentoring them and coaching them for coming up to four years. And it was only recently that they were at a, a seminar in Bali and someone said, you really need God. You really need God. Where you are at the moment, you really need God. And she's come to me in a message and said, I think I need to go to church. And I've fallen off my chair because every time in our conversations I'd say, God, 
she said universe. And I'd say God and she'd say, I'd say Jesus and she'd say universe. So she was really kind of pushing back and eventually someone broke through. And I said, can I take you to church? And she said, I'd love that. So she's been a couple of times now and really wants to push into that. It's not a matter of actually telling some people how bad they are. Sometimes it's a matter of just coming alongside them and letting God do the work over time and it comes to pass. I would have liked to have her soul in the first month or year and yet it's taken four years to get there. It is a journey that we go on with people and it is interesting going back to that book, of course, in Miracles and and there are so many different texts around the place where they can start out with people who are following Christ and they start to veer off. There's this tendency within the human spirit to want to feel like we have a new revelation, that we have something new to bring to it rather than holding on to the tried and tested truth, isn't there? What do you think it is in us that that wants to have this something special, this some new revelation? If I'm not hearing from God or if I'm not under good leadership, then I'm going to look elsewhere thinking there's got to be another answer. There's got to be something out there that can satisfy that need. If you had have said to me X amount of years ago, you'd be reading the Bible every day, I would have gone, yeah, yeah that's hilarious. That's hilarious. And yet I'm reading the Bible every day. I, I run a men's group. I'm under a good pastor. I've got leadership. I've got people who can give me course correction and look after me and put a, an arm around my shoulder and say, hey, have you thought about you might like to, those sorts of things. So I don't believe that you're supposed to do the Christian journey alone. I think church is there for a reason. And for some people, they've never found a good church. And I go, find a good church, find someone that you can put yourself under, good teaching, good biblical teaching that feeds your soul and feeds your spirit so that in doing so, you can draw closer to Christ. It's a matter of, again, I'll come back to that point of we don't do this alone. And the men's group that I run, I didn't want to do it. My pastor at the time said, can you oversee this group? And I said, yes, I'll oversee it, but I've got other things I need to do. And as soon as I said I'd oversee it, the next person came up to me and said, I believe you're the group leader. And I've gone, oh, that was (laughs) that. how did I end up there? And it's been X amount of years later and I'm still running the group, but we do come together and do life together and we're able to speak into each other's lives. We're able to be honest with each other. Iron sharpens iron, the Bible says. So we're able to actually lift each other up. We've gone through some monumental problems of people losing jobs and people getting ill and spouses getting ill, where you need people alongside you to do life with so that they can point you to God. They can go, God's in this. God's with you. God will look after you. The Bible says, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. And to have somebody else say that to you just reminds you to get back on track. I love that. Your wife was the first one who recognised that something was not quite right here and that Christ may well be the answer. Tell me about it. When she first said to you, I really do need to get back to this faith, tell me about someone who can take me there. What was your first thought? (laughs) Well, it was that that friend. We were best mates in the New Age. He mentored me in the New Age and he looked after me in the New Age. We lived together. It was a lovely brotherhood in that regard. And then when he met Christ, The organization banned him, blacklisted him, so I lost my best mate. Every time I went to him, he would bring Christ into the conversation, and I've gone, and just rubbed me up the wrong way. So when my wife said, I want to speak to Alan, I've gone, I don't want to go to Alan because he'll preach at me. (laughs) And yet over time, obviously, it got in because it made the way available, and There's a saying that some people sow, some people water, and some people reap. Fortunately, he was able to do both. He was able to sow the seed of Christ in my life and over time water it, even though I, on the outward side, 
would have said that I was rejecting him and the message, but it was still being watered over time until finally over the lunch table, he's gone, let's do this. So he said it, I said it. And that, as was said earlier, the scales fell from my eyes this time and I got to have a whole bigger understanding of God and the ramifications. Tell me about that journey out, because you mentioned before that it's easy enough to just walk out the door of that cult, walk into the door of a church, but there was a lot more to it internally. Tell me about that struggle for you. The cult had a mantra that you would say under your breath, so in your head. When you received it, you received it from an initiate in the cult, and they would speak it into your ear You would speak it back and that was it. That was the only time you're allowed to speak it. That was it. You would then chant that and every time you went to a different level, you got a different chant to say. Because of that, it was ongoing. It was daily. It was hourly. It was by the minute you were praying and meditating with this chant and therefore it got in. And I was in that one. We're talking 13 years of saying it internally. When I came to Christ, someone said, you know you need to get rid of that. And I go, yeah, and how do I do that? You need to speak it out. And I've gone, no, and still didn't come. And I'm sitting there in the chair. I can vividly remember I'm sitting there in the chair trying to form the words from my brain to my mouth and my lips and my tongue to have it come out, and it would not come out. That's the demonic part of it. It's like it just was not there. And I've got people praying for me, my wife praying for me, and it would not come out my mouth. And I'm in tears. It's like, I don't understand how it's so hard to to just put this thing out there. Why? 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 And eventually I broke it and it came out. And that part of my life, I'd, I'd broken through to the other side of being free from that trap. The New Age has a lot of those small practices that trap you, crystals and palmistry and tarot and those sorts of things that on the outside look spectacular, but the enemy is in that. The enemy has ways of keeping you trapped in that that's not godly. Try and tell me that back in 1997 prior to my salvation, I would have went, you're ridiculous. What do you mean? But a lot of people in the new age don't know that there's an enemy. They think that everything's light and good. We know that there's a battle going on for people's lives. And I was in that battle in that moment, in the chair, in tears, going, I need to break free of this. And I came through. I find it interesting that you mentioned that there are these different levels. And once you achieve a new level, you're given this extra special knowledge. And it mirrors a lot of things that I hear of, of different lodges and things like that, where there are different stages and you work and you work and then you get another stage, sort of like a reward. And the ultimate is to continue to climb up the ladder. And yet I see something different in scripture, where as soon as you come to Christ, it's all open to you. And it may take a lifetime journey to understand what that means. And we continue to grow in that, but it's Not like there are secrets locked away from us until we perform some sort of act, is there? That's right. We're in the family. The moment that you confess that Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross and rose again, then you are in the family. You are a child of God and you're saved. What happened for me was I was able to to leave all of that New Age lie and the lies that were there, and just start that process of unlearning, and it wasn't unlearning, to then the first thing, like on that Sunday, they gave me a Bible, and I wanted to understand Jesus. So I started with the the New Testament. I did Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John to get an understanding of who Jesus was, and that set me up. It's like a lot of people go, oh, I've tried the Bible and Genesis. I just couldn't get through Genesis. It's like, yeah. Get a relationship with Jesus. Get a relationship there first. Find out who he is. Find out what he does. And when I say does, did, does. Why? Because he's alive. He didn't rise from the dead and uh, others like Confucius and, and the like. It's like they're dead and you can you can see where they're buried, buried or whatever that might be. But Jesus is alive. And 
it, it isn't unveiling. It is an, an understanding, a growing in that. My daily Bible reading, daily prayer, the, there's always something that comes out of a Bible reading. You go, that wasn't there the last time I read the Bible. I don't understand. It's like, how come I'm reading it afresh today? That's amazing. So there's always something comes out of it. And for me, I'll do the Bible in one year. I'm currently doing Nikki Gumbel's um, Bible in one year, 2023. And what it enables me to do is he'll do a commentary, he'll do a psalm or a proverb, he'll do a New Testament and then Old Testament. So I'm getting a full breadth of the Bible and the understanding. And I've been reading the Bible now for for years. Every year I'll read it through once a year and I'll do something on a daily basis. But again, something pops out of it every single day. You mentioned that way back then, it was like the scales fell off your wife's eyes when she suddenly realised this is not the direction. And I'm wondering if there may be people listening at the moment who are thinking, ah, the scales are starting to drop from my eyes. I see that there is something that I'm involved in that is not actually helpful for me. And even those who are perhaps Christians, but it's faith in Jesus plus something else, and they're realizing that that plus something else is not good, and maybe the scales are dropping there. What would you say to those people? (laughs) Great question, great question. I'd say... If there's a part inside of you that believes that the secondary practice is a secret, then talk to someone about it. It's like I've got the Bible and I've got something else, or I've got the Bible and, and I see someone in the New Age or I, I'm reading a New Age book, then talk to someone about it. Don't have it as a secret. Again, we're not supposed to do this walk alone. So talk to someone. Again, from a Christian perspective, talk to someone. Now, if you haven't come to Christ, if you don't know God, if you don't know that, then talk to someone who does and say, educate me. Why? What is it that, that I know that's different to what is that you know? So get into a conversation with somebody that can educate you on or give you an understanding as to why we as Christians believe what we believe. Les, these days you are involved in helping people in various ways, and your job is involving helping people with something that is actually personal development for them without the uh, without the extras. I guess it's a world away from where you were first inducted and, and joined into something that had that secret agenda behind it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I needed to unlearn and then relearn. So I came out of the new age and I had my own company in sales and customer service in training so I was doing corporate in that regard and then some things happened and I I, I ditched it all and I went back to hospitality which is my roots then I came here and I happened to be in Geelong in Victoria and someone said you need to start your company back up and I went no 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 I'm not doing that and they said no they need what you have I'm able to go into companies from a corporate perspective and work with people on productivity and time management. I wrote a book called Get Back an Hour Every Day. That was well received to the point where they put me on the Today Show with Carl and Georgie. I'm able to do it at that top level, as well as any small business, entrepreneur, solopreneur, in which I have a coaching business as well. I work with them. The coaching business is called Creating Success Coaching. I don't hold back with my coaching. I will put it out there that God's in in my business and here's the way it works. I was in a call the other day and the only people on the call were Christians. So I was able to just, I went, yep, 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 they're all Christians. So I was able to bring God into the picture. Even more so, I was talking about scripture and talking about a psalm and talking about how this works and how the Holy Spirit helps in, in that regard. Even when I'm in a corporate setting, I'll go, the areas of my life, and I'll talk about the different compartments of my life, and one of them is church. And I'll often have people come up and say, oh, I like the way you put church in there, because no one does. And I wasn't talking about you need to come to faith or I read the Bible every day, but they know that I'm a Christian, and they know that I give myself time to read the Bible, and I give myself time to do the practices that I do. Why? Because I'm in control of my time. And I make time for it. A lot of people just run out of time. And I go, yeah, no, nah, if the, it was good enough for 
of the world leaders to create things with the time that we have. It's good enough for us to create things that we want with the time that we have. Les, I'm sure that there are people that would be interested in gaining an hour back in their day and perhaps grabbing that book. But I'm also convinced that there are people that have been listening and there are things that you've touched on and they think, you know what, there is that in my life that is not helpful and I need to be rid of it. If people are wanting to connect with you in any way, what's the easiest way for them to catch up with you? My website is getmoretime.com.au. So get more time, just get more time, .com.au. It has a store on there. My book is on there. You can buy the book as a PDF download immediate, or you can put in an order for the soft cover and I'll ship that out to you. My phone number is on the website. You can get in contact that way. I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody about my story, about where you're at and how I might be able to help and give some perspective on where you're at. Happy to pray with people on the phone walk you through that salvation prayer that my good friend did with me because I was lost and I had no idea that I was lost and no idea whatsoever. Oh, it gets me every time. It was someone just praying for me and praying for me and praying for me and eventually I came to the realisation I needed to do it and I was able to do it. So happy to pray with anybody if they need prayer. Les, I will put links in the show notes at bleedingdaylight.net so that people can find you easily. But I just want to say thank you so much for being generous with your time and sharing your story today. Wonderful. I appreciate it. It was a lovely experience. I look forward to maybe doing it again. Thanks, Rodney. Thank you for listening to Bleeding Daylight. Please help us to shine more light into the darkness by sharing this episode with others. For further details and more episodes, please visit bleedingdaylight.net.